chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. I'm going to ask you to stand with me as I read this text. The title today under this overarching theme, Mark, the Gospel in Action, is God's response to the treatment of his servants and his son. Probably better in this passage, God's response to the mistreatment of his servants and his son. Follow along, please, as I read this text. He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower. <clears throat> and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to go to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. <clears throat> Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed, and so with many others. Some they beat, and some they killed. He has still one other, a beloved son. And finally he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. You take heed today how we treat his son, how we treat his servants. God doesn't take that lightly. Never has, never will. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, this is a uh, section that appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, Matthew goes into more detail at the end of how he presses. When you, when you read this text and you, and you hear the, uh, he said to them, Begin to speak to them. That's the same them, the scribes, uh, the, the, those who came and, and were testing him. And by what authority you do this? And he shut them down. Remember that? We looked at that. Well, he's, now he's speaking to them. Parables. And they're, gonna, they're not completely stupid. They pick up. He's talking about us. Because of their treatment. So what I want us to see here for a few minutes as we look at this text, is just, just five considerations. Jesus speaks again in parables. He's done this before. Secondly, a serious reflection and foreboding. And then a shocking declaration. And a searing scripture observation. And then a sinful response to a scorching rebuke. It's, it's all there in the text. Let's just let's unpack this here for a few minutes. He, just, he speaks the, in parables. He's done this before we read a section of parables in, in Mark chapter 4. And remember, the, the apostles, the, the disciples ask him, why do you teach in parables? And, and I told you back when we studied that that people say, well, he taught in parables because that was the easiest way for the people to understand. That's not what Jesus says when he's asked about why he teaches in parables. He says, I teach in parables because it's not been given to everyone to understand the mystery of the kingdom. But it's been given to you. And you, you don't have to, when you hear him say, he who has ears, let him hear. He's talking about divine discernment. It's granted by the Lord, ears open, hearts open. You have experienced that, many of you here. Where the word was dull to you before. And then there was a day that came when, when the word became alive. And that's because the living Jesus Christ had come and invaded your life. You're never the same after that. So begin to do this again. For the same agenda. The second thing I want you to see is the serious reflection and foreboding. This, these verses, the, the second part of verse 1 all the way into verse 8, this is a story. The while it is a parable, it is historically true and it will, will be true in the future. There is this, this reflection, this historical reflection when he says that 
a man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. The season comes. The season will bring for him to collect what is owed to him. The agreement is, which you pick this apart, the agreement is you can work in my vineyard, you can harvest the grapes of my vineyard, you can, you can sell them, you can eat them, you can benefit from them, but because it is my vineyard, I'm letting you work there. And there will be a portion of this that comes back to me. And I will send at the, at the right time, I will send someone to collect my portion. So he sent a servant. The tenants, rather than being grateful to even have a place to serve, being grateful to have a, a livelihood, being grateful to fruit to harvest, to sell or to eat, rather than being grateful, they have become stingy. They have presumed upon the goodness of the owner of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And we're not told about the rest of this, but picture this, picture this when, when the man shows up empty-handed to the owner and he's beaten and bloodied. What would be the response to that? <clears throat> We're going to see the patience of God here. Again, he sent to them another servant, verse 4, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. They haven't relented. They, they still have the same horrible attitude, presuming upon the goodness of the owner, in fact, I think you could say that there's a, there's a transition that takes place, and we see it in this country in, in spades. They went from being grateful to be part of an of a enterprise. They didn't, they didn't prepare the field. They didn't build the tower. They didn't dig the wells. They, they didn't prepare the, the vine press. They simply were brought in to be the beneficiaries of it, and somewhere along the way, they they shifted from being thankful to being expectant as if it was owed them. And that is an attitude that we see in our society today. I am owed this. In fact, it's so prevalent that there are people who think they are, they are so entitled that they would rather burn down what someone else has than to work for what they ought to have. And you see this mentality developing here in the Scripture. It's not new, is what I'm telling you. It's anchored in, in, the, in the sinful depravity of the human condition. Well, verse 5, he sent another, and they killed him, so now they, they've ramped it up. I mean, this fellow's not even going to return to the owner. The owner's left to wonder, what happened to this servant I sent? I know they've, they've, they've beaten two of them badly. What's happened to this fellow? They, they kill him. And so with many others. They are, the word would be recalcitrant. They are dug in. <clears throat> some they beat, some they killed. He has one more he's going to send. His ultimate emissary, one other, a beloved son. And you can't read that without thinking about John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his, his beloved. And he said, they'll respect my son. If he goes representing me, they'll respect him. The long suffering of God is incredible. But those ten have said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Just tossed him outside. No burial. Dispose of him. Well, historically, the Jewish people had the prophets sent to them. And they were notorious for mistreating them, rejecting their message. And remember, if you put the chronology of the Gospels together, it's not going to be much later when Jesus, as recorded in Matthew 23, verse 37, stands over Jerusalem. And he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who, who, who stone the prophets, you who mistreat them and slay them, who were sent to you by God. What a, 
what a commentary. You see the heart of Jesus, but what a commentary on a community. What does heaven know Jerusalem for at that point when Jesus is standing there? Heaven knows Jerusalem and the people like them as the folks who reject the message of God, who, who take the blessings of God, will, will gladly have those, take all he offers, take everything he offers, will reject his message. He says, how often I would have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her chick, but you would not. <sighs> Jerusalem. And so we see this, this tragic circumstance. They had, the history of the Jews with the prophets of God was that they rejected the prophets. And the future that was coming in just a few days, this is, this is Passion Week, remember? This is probably Tuesday night of Passion Week. In a few days, they're going to give the ultimate rejection of the Son. They're going to have him crucified. We already told in the text that the religious leaders were there to arrest him. And they chickened out. Third, look at the shocking declaration. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Hmm. Now, as I said, these, these folks, these, these religious leaders, because that's, that's the people in, in Jesus' journey on the earth, that's the folks that are the meanest uh, to, the, to the messengers of God is the religious leaders. They begin to pick up. He will, he, will, he will destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. And they were understanding. They were seeing where he was going. And he presses it. In case there was any missing it, look at number four, a seeing scripture observation. Have you not read this scripture? And I've told you before, folks, we stood, when Jesus says to Pharisees, to scribes, who make it their living to, to pour over the Tanakh, the, the Old Testament, the, 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 the law, the prophets, the, the, the history, history books, the, the poetic writings, to say, have you not read this? It's an insult to them. What he's saying basically is it's, it's as if you had not read it. You read it with no profit. Have you not read in Psalm 118, we, we read this together. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. The context of the, of the passage is the, is the liberation of the people of God as the Messiah comes to be the chief corner. The, this picture is a beautiful picture of cornerstone, if you know anything about that. It is, it is the stone by which the whole building and foundation is marked. It is, it is the tr it's true north, if you can use that analogy. It's true north in the framing of the building and the establishing of it. You get the cornerstone wrong and everything in the building's wrong. But here, the, it's a stone the builders didn't think worthy of their building. And you see the analogy immediately. Jesus comes as the cornerstone. Christ alone, cornerstone, we say. He comes as the cornerstone and they reject him. He's, he doesn't fit their religious thinking. He doesn't fit in with their with the religious pedigree. He, he is not their man. He said, it's the Lord that did this. Now he, at this point, has really pressed them. That the words of Psalm 118, with which they were very familiar, are speaking of him. Oh, wouldn't you, wouldn't you, wouldn't you long for must have broken their hearts. And ask among themselves, how can we be so wrong? How can we be so blind? How can we be so misguided to go through, and at this stage, what, the, what Saul of Tarsus goes through on the road to Damascus when he is encountered and realizes that, that his religious thinking was completely upside down from the way God thinks and the way God reveals. There's a sinful response. Mark tells us, and of course, this is Mark copying Peter's memoirs that they were seeking to arrest him, but they feared the people. So you see, their, their, their determination to walk away wasn't because they were cut to the heart. It's because they were cowards seeking to arrest him. For they perceived that he had told the parable against them, that is the religious leaders. And they left him and went away at that time. Now, when you read this in Matthew and Mark and in Luke, he, uh, Matthew presses this. 
After, after the quotation from Psalm 118, Matthew has this in verse 43 of chapter 21. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. He's talking to them. Will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. He is speaking right to the religious leaders and they know what he's talking about. And they do not agree with him. They do not believe it. But they are, they are pressed. They cannot do anything to this one who has found favor with the, with the populace. It's exactly what Saul of Tarsus experienced, by the way. When he said to him on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Don't you know it's, 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 it's hard to kick against the goads that is, you're going to break your foot kicking against me. It's not said in that passage, but the implication being, I am the cornerstone. You can't move me that easily. And you can't remove me. Seeking to arrest him. Wow. Do you see this? You see, historically, people of God, the, the messengers of God have been mistreated. Jesus told his Disciples, don't be surprised if the world hates you. It hated me first. Don't be surprised if you're persecuted, persecuted for my name's sake. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name's sake. Don't be surprised. But God says to his to the religious people in, in Psalm 105, verse 15, Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. You see, we've got to realize. And it's happening all over the world now. And it's coming, coming home to us as well. Is that his people, his, his messengers, those who proclaim his gospel, are being slaughtered around the world today. We're not being slaughtered around the, around the United States yet. But if the Lord does not turn back the, the cesspool towel tidal wave that is sweeping over our culture it is coming it's coming it's going to cost something to be a follower of Jesus Christ in this culture if the Lord doesn't turn back this cesspool tidal wave but here's the thing you've got to recognize we expect the world to treat God's messengers that way what you do not expect and this is where Jesus uh, indictment so scathing as you do not expect the religious people to treat God's messengers this way and that to me is the tragic thing I've been, I've been in ministry almost 40 years now and I've over the years have talked to pastors and I've seen the tragedy of, of, of young men older men being thrown from their pulpits oh it happens in different ways sometimes leaders just meet and summarily fire them for no reason other times it's more subtle, it's more subtle. They, uh, they'll, they'll quit giving, they'll, they'll uh, lean, put pressure on leaders and, you know, people are saying, well, people, if I talk to some people, and they'll do these kind of things and just subtly pressure good, godly men out. Now, there's some guys that don't belong in the ministry, okay? I saw some of them in seminary. I got a Facebook message from, the, from a woman uh, two days ago. They lived right next door to us in seminary housing at Fort Worth. And her name, I recognized her maiden name, but her, but her married name was different. And she and her husband were divorced and just shocking. He was trained for the pastorate. There's some guys that don't belong in the ministry. I was, I was around them. But I'm talking about the guys who are faithful. I'm talking about the men who stand and preach, thus saith the Lord, who don't, who don't back away, who don't, who don't do this. They don't stick their finger in the air to see which way the wind is blowing. What, what is it the people would like to hear? They don't tickle the ears of people. And you expect the world to be down on these folks. You expect the world to, to hate the message. What you do not expect and what God will not tolerate is for religious people treating his messengers that way. And you can ask the question, this Pat, what will the owner do? Because see, folks, he is the owner of everything we have. Every blessing we experience in life, every blessing we experience here together is a blessing from God. We, have, we haven't worked any of it up. We've, we have worked, but He's the one who blesses. And when we take His blessings as a signal that He approves of us so that we can act any way we want to act, then we are, we are in jeopardy of Him doing 
in religious settings what Jesus taught the owner of the vineyard would do and by application what God was going to do with those who rejected the Son. This is the God who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And when he says in the Psalms, in Psalm 105, do not touch my anointed ones. In other words, don't, don't move against them. And then do my prophets no harm. Don't, don't harm my prophets. The unchanging God says that today. And I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed ten and a half, coming up on eleven years with you here, and thank God for every day of it. And, and through the years, we've been willing to own uh, our sin when we've sinned and repent of that, and we, we repent to one another and forgive one another. And, and I've told you before that it hasn't uh, turned out like, like I thought it would when I came. Yet, it hadn't turned out yet like I thought it would. And so we've enjoyed that. But I want this to be a place where, where, where a pastor, a hurting pastor, can come in and be loved and encouraged because folks there are not many places like that you have to understand that that in many congregations there there's the old adage we, we, we joke about at the seminary where the, where the where members of the church will have the pastor for lunch he just won't be there we need to, we need to embrace this and, and pray we need to pray for pastors there's another one, a dear friend of mine, who's, who's a peer of mine. So he's labored in, in preaching as long as I have. And just heart sick, resigned this past week. So it's difficult. This, I read this and I think, oh God, help your servants. Give people to your servants who will love them who will encourage them, who will bless them, who will hear the word, even the difficult word, who will hear that and, and take it and apply it rather than say, well, this isn't working, let's scrap this and go some other direction. The Lord is patient. We see this in the passage. And I want to say to you, how do we, let's move beyond the service. What about the sun? These, these religious people would have assured you that they were looking for God's Messiah to come. That everything they did in pouring over the scripture and having their rituals and their, and their sacrifices and all that the washing, the ceremony of washings, all that was in anticipation of Messiah. They would tell you that, but they missed him completely. Folks, we must not miss the Lord Jesus. We must not miss His will for us. We must not miss the way He would have us to walk. We, we must not miss those engagings where we are, are conformed to the image of Christ in an increasing way. We must do no harm to the ministry. I know some people, they're not here, thank the Lord, who will have to stand before God one day and say, okay, now tell me, you, you were in four different churches and you led the split in four different churches? You, you were proud of the reputation of running pastors off, of leading that? You, you, and you want me to welcome you into my heaven? I never knew you. Your, your Christian life was lawless with no regard for my word, depart. As Christians, we must live embracing the crucified and risen Savior and reflecting the radical transformation that comes to everyone who names the name of Jesus, who, who has the cross as our salvation and has the crown of Christ where we submit we must as Christians we must do that to do any less I think is to incur the righteous displeasure of God but what about those there are some here and I'm going to close with this there are some here who have not yet confessed faith in Christ and to be honest, if I could take your chin in my hand 
and look at you and plead with you personally. I would do that. Come to Christ. But do you understand that when you have been blessed by God to be put into a home where the gospel is shared, where it's fleshed out, where you're, where you're prayed for, you're prayed over, to be put into a church setting where, where your Bible study teachers press the gospel to you, where in this setting where the gospel is pressed, it is sung, it is prayed, it is preached, that and, and, and not, not respond. No! You haven't murdered a servant of Jesus. And no, you haven't murdered Jesus. But you see, when you, when you will not respond in repentance and faith, you are committing murder. You are murdering your own soul. You're not considering that Christ shed His blood for such as you. It would provoke in you the response of repenting for the sin of ignoring and putting aside and not dealing with the gospel and its implications upon you and to trust in Jesus Christ as your only hope, as the only one who can, who can put in a life into meaning. Yeah. There's a word here for all of us. And we will give account one day. What did you do with the gospel you heard? Did you keep it to yourself? There was a fellow that kept a talent to himself. And Jesus told the story. And it was taken from him and given to the one who, who was in the, in, the, in the business of multiplying what God had given. We are blessed, dear Christian, we are blessed to be a blessing. And those of you who are not yet followers of Christ, I say it that way because my hope and my prayer is that you will become followers of Christ. Do not continue murdering your soul. You do not know what life holds for you. You do not know how many more gospel opportunities you will have. You don't know that. The doctors want to tell us how long we have to live. They don't know that. The Lord has set the bounds of your habitation. He has, he has hedged you in to live this long and no longer. So I plead with you today. Come to Christ. Don't reject the cornerstone again. Come to Christ. And be saved. And they'll be rejoicing in heaven. Brothers and sisters, we'll give account to God. He knows our role in the church. He knows whether we're carrying buckets of water or carrying buckets of gasoline with a match. He knows. He knows. The revelation of seven churches, He haunts us. I know your deeds. I know them. Let us be the people who bless the Lord. And I want to say thank you to those who have blessed me through the years. And blessed this pitiful, feeble, Servant of God through the years. Thank you for that. And thank you for fending off those in the past who would love to have had my head on a platter. Thank you for that. This is the God we serve, and He's unchanging. He's not about to change for us. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your Son. Lord, we repent when we misrepresent Him. We repent when we live in, a, in the midst of a world 
so that we, we have a conflicting message of, by the way we live, with, with, with who he is, what he did, what he will do for sinners. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to live before a watching world. Help us to live before the little ones here in such a way that, that the message is clear. Christ came to save sinners, and I am a, am a pitiful sinner. And yet he saved me. He'll save, he'll save you. Help us to live that way. Help us, Lord, to bless your messengers, your ministers. I pray today that somebody here will, will, will think of someone outside this congregation, someone who's been here and will, and will communicate a blessing to them. Maybe, maybe a pastor or a minister that they know somewhere else will, will speak a blessing, write a blessing, communicate a blessing to them. Because we, that would please you, I know. And then I pray for those who have not killed your prophets. They, they haven't killed your preachers. They haven't killed your messengers. They, they didn't even kill the Savior. He, he died and rose 2,000 years ago. But who, who by, by virtue of continuing to, re, to reject the gospel, continuing to be passive about the gospel, continuing not to embrace Jesus Christ, are killing their own souls. And I pray that you will rescue them this day to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.